Well, uh, as a young man, as a teenager, um, I tried to go as far away from the issue as I could, I think, geographically. Uh, I could have gone to the other side of the world, I suppose, but I made an effort to still ground myself here. I actually hitchhiked across from Sydney, <laughs> truth be told. Um, I ended up in Market River, and, and that's a whole story in its own right. But essentially getting to Western Australia was very important for me to put behind a great deal of sadness and to disconnect myself from influences at the time, which yes, um, would have compromised me even further than what I'd already been. Um, I left behind my family, I left behind my peers, um, and I forged a new life, essentially on the other side of the continent. I wrote a story um, which I began in 2014. Um, the significance of that story was to uh, bring, I suppose to account in my own mind, what had happened to me as a young man and as a boy. And I felt that I needed to put it out in a chronology um, as I saw it. And uh, it prepared me, I think, to be able to eventually uh, take my case to the police. Uh, it was really significant um, to publish that and I did so in such a way that it really caused a great deal of disruption for um, a great number of people uh, that I don't regret. Um, I needed to come to terms with and others needed to come to terms with um, what they had or had not done in relation to my case and uh, in some ways it was a cathartic rendering I would say. In text it was uh, distributed widely and in the lead up to the case it actually became quite central to the evidence that I provided in that court setting and uh, that short book um, will continue uh, through my life to be quite pivotal um, in the change that uh, I felt I needed to take at the time. Apparently, um, having spoken to the detectives and quite a number of other people through time, um, 33 years is only the average um, of when people feel the courage to or are able to uh, consider that their whole life world will collapse when they do speak their truth. Um, it took a lot of thinking deeply about what effect this may have on other people, particularly my children, um, when I spoke my story and, and felt like I needed to go and report to the police. And it took some um, very hard um, to have discussions with people who were very close to me to be able to encourage me to go and uh, take my story forward, which I had, which I had repeatedly said I wished to do. Um, it's been, it was a long time, 33 years, oh, since the last point of assault and so on. And as I've described it, I walked inside my own mind-made prison for those 33 years. But one thing I do recall as a young um, person, um, particularly in the latter half after having taken my story to my parents and nothing had happened as a result, I decided that I would remember every single detail uh, like a, like a video or a film uh, in my own mind. So I had a visual playing record continuously in my mind, constantly, as some would describe flashbacking to those moments. I'd kind of consider it not just as a flashback of an instance, but every single day, sometimes hour by hour, I was trying to, and always would, reiterate to myself and reaffirm with myself that it was wrong, that this was not supposed to have happened, 
that that incident, that incident, this assault, this thing, this thing, that thing, all of those needed to be remembered in place. They needed to be remembered by the person who surrounded the person, what they wore, whether they were stocky, whether they were male, whether that, you know, all of these various details needed to be remembered. Because I thought one day, hopefully, I'll have the opportunity to speak my story to a, um, to a, what I believe to be a, a, a court setting eventually. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's how it was for me. Yeah. Uh, the judicial process is I extremely harrowing. Um, I've only learned from this process that I can now understand, having been on this side, that many pe I can understand why many people do not go through with the legal concourse and chase that legal uh, jurisdiction and that legal follow through. Uh, it really can uh, substantially, and it did, and it has, it has exploded everything about my life. Um, it has really had a colossal impact on myself and my world and my friends, colleagues, family, uh, my children, partners, uh, wives, ex-wives, everybody. Um, it has had, and I know it's had, a really, really destructive um, but also deep reckoning uh, for many people and many people have disappeared out of my life as a result of that but then again I have to also think that many many good people have also come into my life as a result of that so harrowing is the best way to describe that yeah it's been um, just really quite horrific really uh, for some people they've expressed that um, you, you know uh, for a long period of time just get over it get on with your life and forget about it was one way of putting it other people would express yes we understand that you've been through these very hard things Alex but many people have and rather than be the victim why don't you just uh, make a go of your life and get a good job and, uh, you know, get married, have children and, and just settle down in general. So that was another form of, of ways that people expressed that to me, both from family, friends and other professional colleagues also said th similar things to me like that. Uh, and then I had uh, a range of responses from people, particularly when they felt that they were a keyboard warrior and that they could... Uh, express things differently without having to face me uh, and a number of people told me that I should end my life uh, uh, I won't repeat some of the the expressions that they used but they are the most vile form of cyberbullying you can possibly imagine um, and I also had a great deal of people particularly uh, uh, senior and elder people who um, from different cultures who expressed it very differently to that and they ex encouraged me to firstly face my story secondly to find my voice uh, in whichever form that was possible and then from there to take that forward in whichever way that I thought would make the best uh, effect for my own personal well-being and in writing my real story, that was the beginning of that process. Uh, I, I had never really spoken with very much at all with my with anyone really about what had occurred to me. I did a lot of good for a lot of people. I know I've been told through through my life and through time, and I'm very proud of me essentially for having been a person who survived through that and still managed to get some decent you know, things happen in that 30 years happening, and. Uh, and then eventually um, I found it within myself that uh, in order to heal, it would occur with other people, but in order to face the story, I had to be, my, be alone and by myself. And I did that. So that was, yeah, that's how, that's how it went for me, yeah. Uh, I understand the legal fraternity needs 
to be able to protect itself and it needs to also protect the survivor. I don't like using the legal term victim. For me, victim means somebody that is going to fall foul of what they've uh, suffered in their life. I prefer to use the word survivor and thriver, somebody who's actually done something past their, their point of those things that have occurred. Um, and people that use that in their life, I think, are the strongest people that, that I can think of. And I've a great deal of mentors and figures that I can, uh, can recite that have gone through similar to me. But the legal process and the gag order and so on is one aspect to the process. What really disturbed me most uh, in my case is the fact that in the court setting, I had to drill down to the deepest and most uh, difficult. Oh. most difficult, empathetic um, parts of me in order for me to um, not harm or not feel like harming the perpetrator. And I'm very aware that I'm recording this at a point when the sentencing hasn't yet actually been delivered and deliberate, it hasn't been delivered and this film won't be released until such time as that sentencing has fully been expedited and other media people like this have had the opportunity. But I am recording this principally to express what it feels like right now because I don't know how I'm going to be on the other side of the media scrum that's going to occur, if at all. Uh, I'm very lucky to be afforded this reality and being recorded today. Uh, because there are so many people that were never afforded this reality. They didn't get here. They didn't have an opportunity to face down their oppressor. And nor did they have the opportunity to sit empathetically in the dock and know that the accused was still an innocent man until such time as proven guilty. And in my case, in my case, um, all nine counts that I brought that were raised in relation to me, which are of the most extreme forms of physical abuse and sexual abuse, deprivation of liberty, isolation, everything. Um, all nine counts, he was proven and found guilty by an Australian jury after much deliberation and a ex really extensive trial, which has lasted years. And I can now feel that I no longer have to continue to keep reporting to the police, sometimes daily, being interrogated by that system, that judicial system, continuously. It's, it's, it's um, beyond comprehension, this process. I, I, I feel that there is a need in humanity to, in some way, invent and change the way that this process works. I was given the opportunity to sit in a remote room connected by a camera to the actual court proceedings and I chose, after much deliberation, that I wanted to face the oppressor the accused, and I wish to do so for all of those of my peers that I know of who have passed and that I was to not show any form of fear or intimidation by that, that individual, nor by the process. I wish to sit in the dock and I wish for the judge to hear exactly my intonations and my tones and I wanted the defence counsel and the Crown Prosecutor to actually be able to observe me in person to hear my breathing and for the jury to know that I'm a human being, not simply a video that appears from another room. And so it had an absolutely catastrophic effect, I think. Uh, and but a rebuilding and rehealing one for me in that, that angry little child that I'd had living right through into my adult was able to become just a sad little kid 
and that sad child could go back to being sad only and not angry anymore because anger is destruction. So I was able to use that opportunity, that full opportunity to um, address that and put that part back in its logical, chronological time order. Again, none of this comes out of a manual. No amount of psychotherapy, psychology, or any drugs that a psychiatrist are gonna give you are going to realize any of that. This is something I've discovered along this, tr this journey. And so that court setting, even though I had to go through that and be placed right back at the scene, over and over and over and be told repeatedly that I had perhaps fabricated this story and that perhaps I was even responsible for the deaths of other people because if I had known that the accused was uh, of this nature that I could have protected them. The most vile and despicable things are thrown at you as a, as a uh, survivor by the defence counsel who despite even the law had dug into my past and had accused me of being every na name and form of things which I know I am not and of which other people know I am not. So yes, it's an extremely harrowing thing for people. Well, grateful that I'm alive, I think, firstly. <laughs> uh, and the reason being is because there are so many people that I know of particularly from that time period in my life, who who, who can't be here, who are here but can't be present in this reality. They didn't get the opportunity to share and grow their life. Uh, and uh, what's going through my mind a lot uh, has been, I actually feel proud of my own actions. Um, it's not about prideful justice. This is not about pride. Proud is probably not quite the right expression, but perhaps in some way um, I feel that justice was served uh, but justice is different to everybody. Their sense of justice is different. In my case, I've been able to live, breathe and have a good life and I'll continue to till I'm not here on earth. And I have to carry this story through for the rest of my days. You never, ever, despite what anybody says, get over it. <laughs> you don't get over it. You learn to live with it differently. And for each and every survivor that ever I have ever spoken to or who comes forward and shares their story with me, they also say similar things. And it's the most dispiriting thing for other people who have never been through such an incident in their life uh, to simply think that for convenience we can dismiss that which has forged our life forever. So what we need to do is we need to go forward as a humanity. We need to dismantle those institutions which harbour and which protect and hide these monsters. And we need to forge a new humanity that's not led by a technological singularity. We need to lead a life that is led by human empathy. Because long after we have disappeared as a humanity on this earth, it will have healed itself. But these crimes that are happening now are crimes of humanity. And that's what we need to do as a humanity. Uh, everybody has a story and every single person 
whilst they have a right to privacy, also maintain very long and deep secrets within their life. And sometimes it's very important for others, not yourself, and not myself in my case, to hold those secrets. I, in my case, um, took my story forward to many times to different people thinking that I would receive listening and be believed and that action would occur. So for those people who see this in the future, from now, I have a really um, pertinent message meaning that don't think for a moment this is about hope. This is not about hope. This is about action. When you have something in your mind that you know is a secret and is a crime against humanity, you must do everything in your power to speak that out, no matter what. And yes, your life world will collapse. And everything that you know about your life will change, absolutely. But in the new life world that you create, you are central to yourself. You're not separate to yourself any further. And you'll have lived a better life having done so.